Good morning. Good morning. Keep your Bibles open. Um, everybody, before we start, take your fingers and go like this, stretch them out. You're going to need it today. Okay. Get them limber. I don't want to be straining anybody, anything here. All right? Okay, you ready? You ready good? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Let's look at verse 15. How many of you guys actually have a star next to this verse? Alright, you know what that star means? What do you mean? It's a prophecy, but a prophecy of what? Messiah. Yes, it's a messianic prophecy. So this is the first one that you find in Scripture. Genesis chapter 3. And here we find God speaking to the serpent and telling the serpent that I will put, this is chapter 3, verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. What does that word enmity mean? Hostility, hatred, that God is going to place between humanity and Satan. Separation. Good choice of words. A desire in the heart not to follow Satan. Okay? Enmity. There'll be something there that will drive us away. Now, is that enmity just for snakes? Because there are a lot of people who just don't like snakes. They seem to freak out. Snakes are actually, they're a good thing to have. Not as pets, but they're neat. Especially if you have uh, an overabundance of rats. Snakes are your best friend. Okay? So God's not talking about snakes. God is talking about the devil himself. Now, we've gone through this a while back ago. What I want you to see here is that God is showing you that there are two seeds that walk this earth. There are the seed of the children of God, and then there are the seed of the children of Satan. And the question is, is where do you fit in in your life here on earth? Whose seed are you from? God to that. Right? Do you have a, uh, it's a supernatural hatred for hatred, right? Yes. Yes. So God says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. That is the first messianic prophecy that God gives to us. Turn back with me, if you will, to Isaiah. Let's look at chapter 9 again. Look at chapter 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles. Verse 2. The people who walked in darkness. Who are the people who walked in darkness? That would be the Gentiles, right? The Gentiles have seen there you go. I'm going to turn that down just a little bit. Have seen a great light. What you get from this verse is that this Messiah, this Savior, is a Savior for the world. It's not just a Savior for Israel or for the Jews. But Jesus came to save the whole world, Jew and Gentile. Amen. That encompasses everybody. What I want you to see here and start to think about this time of year is what did God actually do for us in giving us His Son? It has been over 2,000 years. And this time of year comes around and our thoughts are brought back to that birth in Bethlehem. Or it's brought back to a little guy in a red suit. Has this time of year become just too commercialized or no big deal. Some of us can't wait till it's over. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but what I want you to think about this morning 
and between now and the 25th of December is what did God actually do for you personally? Okay? Because Jesus came to save the world, but he came as a personal Savior. Amen. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. When we choose to give our hearts to him, when we accept the present that God has given to us, we do it as individuals. Is that right? Amen. Can your church save you? No. Can being a part of a corporate body save you? No. So you have to come to God on an individual basis, and you have to go to your God and accept His way of salvation. Amen. And that way was found in a manger 2,000 years ago. Did you ever think what Jesus went through the day before the angel came to Mary and said, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you, and you will bear a son and call his name Jesus. In heaven, still God, before he became flesh. <coughs> the clock is ticking at a certain time. Let me ask you a question. When did Jesus actually leave heaven and become this baby? Hold on. What'd you say, Ricky? When does life begin? So think about this. Before conception, he's there in heaven, standing right beside the Father. The angels are able to see him. The moment of conception, it's gone. And God is stuck inside this poor teenager's womb. Okay? God in the belly. You ever think about that? What were Jesus' thoughts right before that time happened? What has God told that thought for you? What did God do for you? Now I want you to think about this because prior to the incarnation, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit were able to see time, past, present, and future all as one. You guys understand that, right? That's why, that's why he's gone. Time is, he's not, he's not bound by time, he's not bound by space. I tell you in the book of Revelation that in that first three chapters, you see Jesus standing in the midst of seven candlesticks. Each one of those seven candlesticks represents a church. If you're historical in your interpretation of prophecy, you realize that each one of those churches represent not just the church, but also a time period. Jesus is able to see time, and God is able to see time, past, present, and future, all as one. It's no difference whether it happened a thousand years ago, this day, or a thousand years in the future. He's able to see that. But as soon as Jesus became flesh, and was put inside the womb of Mary. That ended for him in that part of his life and existence. Yeah. What was he thinking? Because he could see the future. He could see where this beautiful gift was headed. Can you imagine the good bond that was between him and his father? Yeah. Ricky, what was your comment? You know the story of the pearl of great price? Yes. Now, that should be our story, but it was his story. He purchased the pearl at great price. And I think that was on his mind when, when, he, when he left. He was going for the greatest thing that he wanted. That was his greatest. Do you know what the greatest thing he wanted? <coughs> it was to be able to see your face Amen. throughout eternity. Amen. It says that for the joy that was set before him, your salvation... He was willing to endure the shame. Amen. Amen. Now, how many of you guys here have ever had to say goodbye to a parent, a child, who you didn't know if you would see them again, who'd be gone on a long journey? Think of what that last goodbye between the father and the son before he became incarnate. 
knowing where this was headed, what it was going to do, that it would lead to the cross. But listen, not just a cross, but he would live on this earth for over 30 years in a world that was dominated by darkness. He would be a great light. And he would live and walk and breathe and work and do it without falling to the temptations and the sin of the devil. Now, if you walk your everyday life, you deal with all the temptations that come to you day by day. And we fall, right? Yeah. He never fell. And he never fell because he was able to continuously see the end result. And that would be you being saved, you being in his kingdom, placing you as a daughter of God, pure and holy and undefiled. And because of that, he was willing to suffer everything that he did. He was willing to leave the glories of heaven. Do you ever think about what those glories wow. are? Can you imagine living in a place that has no darkness? There is never around the throne of God, never a misunderstanding or a thought of, what do you really think about me? What are your real motives? That you love me and you would give everything you have to make sure I have what I need. That's selflessness. That is what Jesus left to come here to live in a world of selfishness. And live a life of selfish or selflessness to show us what God is really like. And was he successful? Yes. He is the only human being who could ever say, the devil comes and finds nothing in me. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Yes. What has God done for you? So let's go back to Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, that's you and me, brothers and sisters, upon them a light has shined. And that light is the light of the world. He is the life of all mankind. That in him was life, unborrowed, ungiven, a life that could never be taken away. Jesus said plainly, I lay down my life and I have the power to what? Take it back again. Do you understand how he was able to say that? Because on the cross, did he die? Yes. yes. Halfway. No. No. He died. He, he laid his head down. He chose the very exact moment. I want you to think about this. When Jesus took on humanity, was he fully man? Yes. yes. And did he, did he lay aside his divinity? No. He was fully divine, right? Amen. Can divinity die? No. no. So on the cross, did he fully die? <laughs> That's right. This is why he could say, I lay down my life Amen. and I have the power to take it again. But you find that on resurrection morning, who called him to come out? So, you need to understand just how unique Jesus is. Amen. Can you imagine having divinity and humanity in the same body? Can you imagine the struggles that you go through? Bless you. With, with, with a fallen sinful nature and the struggle it is for you to keep your eyes focused on Christ. Can you imagine the struggle he went through having divinity and humanity in the same time? This is why he's able to be your high priest. Amen. He has been touched with everything you will ever be touched with. We could be kept it that way. Think about it. Yeah. 
So what this should do, brothers and sisters, is give you great joy and give you an idea of the power that God has given to you through Jesus by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And if he lives in you, that power to overcome now lives in you. Right? Amen, amen, amen. What has God done for us? So reading back in Isaiah, let's look at verses 6 and 7. What has God, God done for us? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is what? Amen. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus was raised, after he went to the cross, after he poured out his blood, after he poured out his love, and he said, it is finished, did he go back and take his divine state again? Or did he keep his humanity? When he was resurrected after the third day, what kind of body did he come back with? A human glorified body. Do you realize that when God says here that unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, Jesus was given to us for all eternity. When he became man, he became man for all eternity. That would be like you becoming an ant so you can save all of the ant kind and you can relate to them. And you would stay an ant for all of eternity. What has God done for us? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. How can Jesus be called the Everlasting Father? He's one with the Father, okay? Now, now, prior to his birth, when they read the Torah and they read this, what do you think they thought? He was going to set up the earth. How could he be called the everlasting Father? He's a creator. Now, Jesus said, explain this to me when he was talking to the scribes and Pharisees. God said to David, uh, now I have it, now I can't remember what it says. I may remember it in a second here. That's what happens when you get old. <laughs> Another time, Jesus was talking with the scribes and the Pharisees, and they were talking about their fathers, right? And the leader said, well, we know who our father is. Yeah. You understand what that meant? That they were accusing him of. Yeah. Now, how many of you guys came from a really small town? Raise your hand. Do you know small towns? Everybody knows your business. You never escape. Who they view you to be, you'll be that to the day you die. Small towns. Can you imagine what it was like for Mary to come back from Elizabeth's house and She's pregnant. Yeah. And her husband, her, her betrothal, Joseph, saw her go away not pregnant, mm -hmm. coming back pregnant. The rest of the little town there saw her go away not pregnant, coming back pregnant. She never escaped that. And Jesus, while he was after his birth, never escaped that as well. How do these leaders know what his history was? small town, right? So everywhere he went, people were talking, do you know, do you know, do you know how he was born? Do you know who his father is? But what did Jesus say? They said, we have Abraham as our father. And they were proud of him. Because it meant they had a place in heaven, right? And that's how they were going to get there, because Abraham was their father. That's what they thought, right? right? What did Jesus say to them? Abraham was I am. <laughs> and 
what did they do? They wanted to pick up stones and they wanted to kill him. Now, think about that. Now, think about what you just read here in Isaiah. He is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And he tells them who he is, and what did they do? They wanted to stone him. So again, I asked you, what did they think when they read these texts? You can read your Bible, you can know your Bible, but you can never, there are times when... If your heart isn't open and you're not submitted to the will of God, all that reading and all that knowing will profit you nothing. Does the devil know the Bible? Yes. The devil knows the Bible better than anybody in this room. Yeah. Does it help him? No. Didn't he tell him they were of the father of the devil? Yes. Now, we just we, we watched a a video in our Sabbath school class that dealt with the hatred that the leaders had for Jesus. Jesus did not water down his message to them. He told them exactly what the truth was. And he said, your father is the devil. You show that who your father is because you agree with what your fathers have done. They killed the prophets, and you adorn their tombs. And they hate you <coughs> for telling the truth. And now, have you ever wondered this, and this is what we watched today, finally answered this question for me. The Jews said to Pilate, we want him dead, but we don't have the right to kill anybody. Is that true? Because, man, if I remember right, three years after this, they stoned Stephen. And, and, and they, didn't, they didn't have to get their permission to do it. Is that right? Way they wanted him They wanted him killed in the most humiliating way to show the people that he was not from God. Envy, jealousy, revenge. They truly were of their father, the devil. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Turn with me now to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 6. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Who is that prophesying about? It's not Jesus. John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. Right? Jesus' is cousin. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked, the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the, of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Turn with me now, two chapters over to Isaiah 42. Let's look at verses 1 through 4. Behold my servant who I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coast, coastland shall wait for his this prophecy 
shows you the character of Jesus in his humanity. It gives you an idea of how he would deal with people. One of the greatest things about the Gospels is the Gospels show you how Jesus interacted with humanity. When you read the Gospels, who did Jesus show the most, the most mercy to? The people that the world considered the deepest, greatest sinners, right? And who did he reserve his most harshest words for? The ones that the people thought truly spoke for God. Mm -hmm. Jesus stood up against hypocrisy and he showed truth. What truth did he show? He showed the truth of who and what God the Father really is. Amen. That the Father is not like the scribes and the Pharisees. He is not harsh. He is not demanding. He is not a tyrant. But he is love. Now notice I didn't tell you he has love. I told you that he is love. Can anyone here sitting this morning say that you are loved? No. I can say that I have loved and I have been loved and I know what love is, but I can't say that I am loved. God is love. Amen. Jesus showed what that meant. And Jesus told you that that is what you're called to become. Yes. We are called to become love. Amen. 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 Let's look at 42, verse 4. <clears throat> he will not fail nor be discouraged. How many of you guys have been discouraged in your walk with God? Put your hand. <laughs> Give a raise, because I want to I see. Okay? It's a majority of, of those here. We also have two natures. Jesus had a human nature yes. and a divine nature. Is that right? Mm -hmm. When we're born into this world, when we come out of the womb from our mothers, we are born with one nature, and that's a fallen nature. When we accept Jesus Christ, we are given what? A new nature, which does not surpass the first nature. We now have dual natures. You have a fallen nature that you're born with, but now you've been given an unfallen nature. And the two are constantly at war with each other. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And there are times when you can really relate to Paul when he cries out, O oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me from this body of death? Yeah. But you know, that cry that Paul made, is the best state that you could possibly be in because it shows you that you in your fallen nature can never save yourself. Amen. But listen very carefully. You with your new nature cannot save yourself either. Amen. Hence, Paul makes this cry before conversion when he made that cry after conversion. Do you know why? Because he says before he makes his cry, the good that I want to do, I don't do. Amen. The Bible tells you plainly that you can't do any good. Right? That the law of God is enmity to the fallen sinful flesh. So if Paul was trying to keep the law, trying to do it in his converted form, but he's saying the good that I want to do, I don't do. There is in me the will, but I don't find the way. What is it that God gives you the power to do? When you've come to the end of your rope and you cry out with Paul, Oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me from this body of death? And you look and you start to see the sinfulness of sin. And you see the purity of Jesus Christ and the purity of God. And you realize that only a Savior can give you what you need. And you finally give up your will and you accept His will. And now His will becomes your will. And His life is your life. I am crucified with Christ. 
and yet I live. It's no longer I that lives, but it is Christ that lives what? In me. Do you understand that? You come to the end of yourself, and you realize that there is nothing righteous in you. Nothing. Oh, when you get to that point, now you have been emptied of yourself, and God can fill it, right? And when God can fill it, now you have His righteousness. Now you have His Spirit. Now you have His life. Amen. We no longer walk in the flesh, but we walk and live and breathe and move in the Spirit. Turn with me to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Ray, can you read verses 1 through 3? Sure. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was placed upon him. And by his stripes, what? We are healed. Who is that talking about? For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And when he grows up, this will be his lot in life. He will be a man of sorrows. We will esteem him smitten, stricken of God. And we will turn, as it were, our faces away from him. Because the law says anyone that is hung on a tree is cursed of God. This is why he had to be crucified. This is why he was hung on the tree. This is why he resisted not when he was arrested. This is why he resisted not when he was before Pilate. And Pilate said, do you not know that I have the power to set you free or crucify you? Now, what did Jesus say? He said, you have no power at all unless it was given to you from above. All right. This is God's will. How can I turn away? Do you realize that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he made that choice. He fought the battle, and he sweat great drops of blood so that you and I could be saved. Amen. And he chose... He chose to go to the cross. And once he made that choice, he never looked back. He never stopped and said, Father, please help me. He asked that in Gethsemane. He received the help in Gethsemane. And from that point on, he followed God's will all the way to death. So that you and I could live. Do you realize you will never, ever, ever pay for your sins? Ever, if you are in Christ, because Christ has paid for them already? Amen. Do you realize that in Christ you will not have to bear what you should receive for those sins? Do you realize that you will never taste what real death is in Christ? This is why he was able to say that if you believe in me, you will never die. Either one of his followers are dead. Right? He said that to him. How could he say that? He said that because the death that they die is not real death. When God said to Adam and Eve, if you eat of this fruit, if you touch it, you shall surely die, it wasn't talking about the death that we experience on a daily basis. Getting run over by a bus. Getting a disease and dying living to old age, and finally your heart just gives out for the rest of your body. Mm -hmm. That's not the death that God was talking about to Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. 
God was talking about the death that Jesus died on the cross. That's the death that they deserved. And that's the death that you and I deserve because we are sinners. But do you understand what God did for you? Through Jesus Christ, you will never, ever have to pay for any of the sins you have. Now you say amen, but you better understand that it also means that the people who have sinned against you, who have hurt you really bad, if they accept Jesus Christ, they will never have to pay for those sins either. Amen. This is why you're called to forgive. Yes. And you can't do that on your own. But through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, God can allow you to forgive. Amen. Let's look at verse 6. All we like sheep have what? Gone have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who would declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Have you ever thought this through? What did that verse say? Please. It pleased the Father to bruise the Son. It pleased the Father to lay on Him all of yours and my sin. Do you understand now why this is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Because He paid for your sin. How great, how evil, how wicked it was, Jesus paid the full penalty of it. But do you realize there are people who could be sitting here today who will think to themselves, I'm not that bad of a sinner. <laughs> I know real sinners, and I'm not one of them. What did Adam and Eve do? They took a piece of fruit and they ate. Yes. Now, how many of you, when you were kids and your mama told you, don't you touch that cookie? <laughs> Stay out of that cookie jar and you waited for her to leave. What's the first thing you did? She may not have even had a leash. She just had to turn her back for a couple seconds. Man, how hard she worked. You had your hand in that cookie jar, right? This is the problem of humanity: is we do not see the sinfulness of sin. We're able to see the sinfulness of other people, but it's hard for us to see our own sinfulness. Amen. Yet it bruised, or yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul, when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. What does that mean? He shall see his seed. What is the seed that he shall see? Us. It's us. Very good. You and I. He sees your face. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows you personally. Brothers and sisters, you hear this all the time, and sometimes we've heard it so much that it doesn't even affect us no more, that God loves you. But when you see what God did to His Son, and that it pleased Him to do it to Him, so that you and I could be saved, amazing grace, how sweet the sound to save a wretch like me. I was once lost, but now I'm found. Blind, but now I see it. What is it that God has done for us? Mm. What more could He do for you than for me? If this does not touch your heart, there is nothing more that can be done. There is nothing more that can be said. If you want to go on in your life of sin, you have made that choice. And God will allow you to reap the consequences of your choice. Do you realize that God doesn't shut anybody out of heaven? You take yourself out of it because you wouldn't be happy there for Amen. all eternity. Amen. So Amen. God being loved allows you Amen. to have what you want. Mm -hmm. 
You want to be your own boss? You want to be your own man, your own woman? You want to do things your way? God will allow you to do that. Jesus. And in the end, God will allow you to reap the consequences of that. Amen. And if it's eternal separation from Him, it's not His fault. Amen? Amen. 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 It's your choice. Amen. This is why over and over again the Bible tells you, choose ye this day whom it is you will serve. What more could God do? He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Do you realize that you, you are the pleasure of the Lord. Amen. That it's God being able to see your face and know that you will be with Him throughout eternity that allowed Him to give up His life freely to sacrifice everything for you and I. Turn with me to Isaiah 61. Read it right. Verse 11 says, If he shall see of the travail of his soul, it shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall men, my righteous servant, justify men. Do 12 as well. For he shall bear their iniquity. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he, he was numbered with the transgressor, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressor. Do you ever think that Caiaphas was thinking about this text? when he was playing his role in the death of Jesus? Yeah. Do you not think that the Spirit was bringing upon these leaders this whole chapter? Do you realize that a lot of Jews won't look at that chapter? Because how can you not see a suffering Messiah in that? Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Brothers and sisters, one last set of texts. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 1. And this is where we'll finish. Matthew chapter 1. Verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found the child of the Holy Spirit. And then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, was not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated what? God with us. And then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Verse, or chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when they had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. 
God gave them 30 years to understand what the, what the prophetic timetable was. The wise men came. Herod the king was troubled. Why? Because he wanted to see and worship this king? He wanted to kill him because he saw him as a threat. The scribes and the Pharisees who he gathered together to help understand where was this king going to be born, what time was he going to be born, and how come you guys didn't tell me he was here? Why are we hearing it from wise men coming from the east? Right? Now those men who told him the prophecies and allowed him to go and kill all the babies never gave their heart and never saw fully what the scriptures were saying. And when Jesus came, they were unaware. Brothers and sisters, as I close this morning, I want you to understand that we celebrate the birth of Jesus and the world loves Jesus as a baby, but they reject him as a man. And Jesus came the first time, and Jesus promised he will come again the second time. And the world is in the same condition it is when he came the first time. When it comes to understanding where we are in prophetic history, are you ready for his second coming? Or will you be caught by surprise like they were in Jerusalem? The baby has been born, their Messiah was here, and they did not even know it. The only ones who came and worshipped him were shepherds who were out in the field. And then as time went by, the wise men came. You guys do understand that they didn't come the same night, right? right. Because it tells you in the scriptures that the wise men came to the house that they were in. And Herod had a reason for killing the children two years and under. Okay? Because they inquired of when they saw the star. And the two year period would cover who he was looking for. Right? How many signs has, has God given us? Now you are seven day Adventists. How many signs? has God given us to show us where we are in his prophetic timetable, that Jesus is coming soon. What other prophecy has to be fulfilled? There's only one. Do you know what that one is? The gospel going to all the world. And that is the sign. Jesus said it's not earthquakes, it's not wars, it's not rumors of wars. It is going to be the gospel preached to the entire world, and when that happens, then the end will come. How close are we to that happening? Do you realize that you have now the only time in history, the technology that you can do that that quick? Think about it. Where are we at in God's time? Are you ready for Him to come this second? Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 125.